You're listening to the Spend 10K a Day podcast brought to you by the performance marketing experts at Mute6. This is your source for cutting edge insight into the world of online advertising from the team with more Facebook case studies than any other agency on the planet. Here are your hosts, Steve Wise and Stuart Anderson. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Spend 10K a Day podcast. Today, we have an incredible guest, um, Evan Tardy, who's president of Dr. Axe, uh, probably one of the fastest growing brands on Facebook. They, they're they one of the best at doing longer form content um, on Facebook that turns, obviously, into acquisition. They're in that... They're really good at acqui- you know content acquisition, and I'm really excited to uh, you know pick pick Evan's brain and really share some amazing insights with with, uh, with all the listeners today. So Evan, thanks for coming on, man. Awesome, I'm glad to be here, and uh, yeah, happy to uh, be part of the podcast and and hopefully share some valuable insights with with your audience. Cool, man. So first off, just tell us a little about yourself before we get into Dr. Axe and you know, tell us a little about your history, your background. I think it's really important uh, for all listeners to understand you know, how you got into this space. It's kind of interesting because I heard you speak at uh, Ezra Firestone's uh, Blue Ribbon uh, Mastermind originally. Cool. Yeah. So for me personally, I, uh, you know, I come from a long line of, of entrepreneurs. You know, my granddad left the family farm to go start a company and um, – uh, and my dad took over that company later on, and then my dad's an entrepreneur. And uh, I started my first business when I was 16, and it was a mobile car wash. And so I would uh, I, I put this 750 gallon tank of water on the back of a trailer, and but the trailer wow. was actually <laughs> yeah, it was actually weighted for for a truck, and so huh. um, it, it, which is which is normal, right? But this is a massive um, uh, water tank. Waited for a truck, but I had a, a I had an old school caddy, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> that I that I put a hitch on, and <laughs> that's funny. So that all that weight was on the back of that hitch, and, and created this low rider. But I would roll into school like that, dragging and scraping over the speed bumps. You'd be and... surprised; those caddies are pretty strong. They got they got some they got some torque, you know. Those old ca- <laughs> yeah. old school caddies, you know. <laughs> it, it was a tank, man. Yeah, and so. Uh, you know, I learned early on if I wanted if I wanted a, a new pair of shoes or, or something uh, above and beyond or something special that you know I would have to kind of earn earn it myself. And so entrepreneurism is is kind of in my DNA. And um, my I went to school for advertising and, and small business is always just mm-hmm. uh, something I'm really have been passionate about. And uh, as I was graduating, I got introduced to Dr. Axe and. At the time, he was running a, a healthcare clinic here in Nashville, and his website, DrX.com, was was really more of a side project. Um, it was really a way for him to, he, you know, he, he's huge into nutrition and wellness, and our, our whole brand is about empowering people to really transform their lives using the power of nutrition and food and these holistic, kind of timeless principles. And so... That's what his his clinic was all about, and uh, and Doctor X is, is he's a close friend, and I call him Josh. But he's uh, <laughs> he, he's personally really passionate about uh, nutrition, and so that's uh, something that he he would print out these articles and hand them out in uh, to all of his patients that were Evan, coming through Evan, the clinic. You, you missed we missed out on a key tidbit of information there. For what all the listeners out there, Doctor X, his real name is Josh. Just FYI, his real name is Josh. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, he was handing out these these uh, printed articles, and you know, his patients would ask him, like, "Hey, I'd love to be able to send this. Do you have this online somewhere in an email I could send to uh, friends and family that aren't in Nashville?" And so he started posting it online, and uh, it, I think his site had about three hundred, four hundred visitors at the time when he and I first met. Uh, three hundred, four hundred visitors per month. And so he and I met and he kind of shared, he shared the vision with me about where he wanted to kind of grow the brand and, and the site. And, you know, I kind of spent some time researching some of the stuff that he had already put out. And I was just really inspired by what, by what he had already done and, and really the mission that he was on. And uh, I remember during our first phone call, he had said, um, have you, he, he asked if I had read uh, The 4-Hour Workweek. 
And then um, another book by an obscure, no-name wine wine enthusiast and marketer at the time, known as Gary Vaynerchuk. <laughs> an obscure wine enthusiast. <laughs> yeah. Boy, his bread has grown a little bit since then, just a tiny a, bit. A little bit, yeah. And so uh, he has to buy a red crush it. And I, I called him back the next week, and you know, I said, uh, hey, listen, I've read both those books. Uh, I haven't done the stuff in there yet, but I know I can figure it out. And uh, if I have to stack chairs to be a part of, you know, what you're doing, I'm in and, uh, you know, I'm, let me know. And so he said, okay, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you call me when you get to town? And so a month later, my wife and I moved to Nashville and, uh, called him up and I'm like, Hey, I'm here. L- l- let's go. And he was like, okay, well, uh, why don't you come over on Monday, you know, Monday morning and we'll talk. And so I brought my laptop over and he made me these, uh, he's kind of famous for his gluten-free blueberry pancakes. And so he made me oh, some pancakes. Sounds amazing. <laughs> we talked for a little bit and uh he, he slid over a piece of paper across the table and you know i was thinking it was a job offer uh, and i and i lifted up and it's the wi-fi password <laughs> 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 and uh and so what's you know, this oh it's wi-fi got, oh, damn it <laughs> <laughs> that's how we got started man and so yeah from his kitchen table and uh you know just off the laptops and then you know shipping product out of the garage so that was about uh, eight years ago, and uh, you know, to this day, we, we've grown a lot. We, we've tried a lot of stuff, thrown a lot of stuff against the wall, and uh, we'll get into some of that stuff that's worked for us, uh, I'm sure, in this interview. But um, we made a ton, a ton of mistakes in the early days. Um, but one thing you know, I've always really appreciated about Josh is that he's a, a big advocate in in creating space to make mistakes, but yeah. learning from those mistakes and then getting better. So fail, you know, what were some better. of the mistakes that you guys would make that, that you, you know, you could stress to other listeners and say, Hey, like this is, this was epic. You know, we learned so much from this, like from, you know, doing e-commerce at scale and building content around, like, tell me more. I love to pick your brain on that. Like just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so we, <laughs> one of our first ideas was, you know, I remember someone saying we were slowly kind of growing an email list, and I remember someone saying, uh, "Well, how are you monetizing your list?" And I was like, "Mono, what? You know, like <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even know some of these. The, you know, me, big, I didn't know these those things. big internet marketing words. You don't know what monetization means." <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I was uh, I was just willing to jump in, you know, both the figure it out and not know, you know, what some of these big things meant. So in Josh in the same way and, and has been really empowering. So, so one of our first ideas was, um, to model, uh, Dave, Dave Ramsey is based here in Nashville down the street from us. And one of our first ideas was we we're going to model this. He had a program called financial peace university and they'd, they'd been really successful selling it into churches. And it's like a 12-week program, you know, and you, you, you have a coordinator and they bring people together and they meet once a week and a uh, really, really successful uh, program. And so we thought, well, what if we created a similar thing modeling that, but it's uh, the health university or whatever. And so we called it the Real Body Revolution. And the, we spent a lot of money on getting it filmed and created and had a full-day workshop and it was um, – six one hour sessions that Josh taught each of them and really in depth, really great content, but our, our idea for selling it never really clicked. And so we are going to turn it into a physical thing and try to sell it into churches or, or corporate, you know, let it be a corporate wellness program and try to sell it into big corporations. And, um, you know, pretty, pretty much as soon as we finished creating that, that six DVD set, uh, physical program, um, there was a partnership that we were, we were considering, and uh, because of that, they already had a similar type of program, a, a corporate yeah. wellness program. And so we decided, all right, we're, we're not going to sell that. <laughs> and so it literally, we, we had bought a thousand of these DVDs, and they literally are, are collecting dust in the garage. And just like looking at these things, like, man, you know, there's got to be a way to like make this thing work. And so our, one of our first, so that was a, a, an early mistake, but as we were kind of kept learning and Josh and I were kind of collaborating and, and brainstorming stuff, one thing that came up was just the power of, of using webinars to sell programs. And so, you know, we spent a couple of weeks 
setting up a sales page and basically ripping off of this DVD, ripping it and putting it into a little Kajabi online membership program yeah. and all this great content that we hadn't been able to sell the physical, but we thought maybe we could sell like a digital thing. And so we put it all up in a, my Kajabi and downloaded like a little go-to webinar, you know, uh, the, the little app. And I think it was 50 bucks a month, you know, and we're like, all right, <laughs> we, we, can, we can afford that, you know, as long as we like cancel it next month, you know, so it's not ongoing. <laughs> it's funny. And so we just scrapped all these pieces together and uh, put together a little sales page and sent out a little email and said, hey, you know, I'm doing this webinar, get on it. And uh, this was our first webinar and we had no idea to even be nervous about the tech not working. It was like, <laughs> <what>? <laughs> so rule number one, if, you do, yeah. <laughs> if you're doing anything with tech, make sure the tech works. If you're communicating with your customers, if you're building a con – a content business, make sure that whatever you're doing to communicate with that people is actually, yeah, it's a great lesson. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so we had, we had no idea to even be nervous. We just sent an email and expected people to show up. And, uh, fortunately we, uh, we put together the whole, the whole sales page and that they buy it, they go here and they get the login and all of that. And, uh, <laughs> And so Josh did the webinar, and then at the end of it, he said, all right, hey, if you want to you know, check out this program, go to the sales page, and he sent out the link. And, and I remember, I used eJunkie. I think eJunkie was $5 a month at that time. <laughs> e I think it still is. I don't know I if they that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. That's a long time. It's old so, school. Old school. And so I, I, I was refreshing, drag to refresh, drag to refresh, as soon as the webinar was over. And we saw a couple sales came in, and they're 100 bucks a pop. And I was like, wow, this worked. Like, I did a couple <laughs> You look surprised. 10 cells, 20 cells, 30 cells. And within the course of an hour, we made over 100 cells of this $100 program. And that was the moment, for me at least, when kind of the light bulb went off. And I thought, wow, this is unbelievably powerful. And now if we could figure out how to get more people on a webinar <laughs> – yeah. Right. And then get more people to pay a little bit more for a program. Like we can start to wedge, you know, a space in kind of this profitable uh, offering. And so that that was that was a, an early failure that really turned into kind of a um, a a big kind of paradigm oh. and, and pivotal I'm shift. Understanding that the the information yeah. that you're producing is very valuable that there is a, va a dollar sign that you could put on the information that you're producing that people will pay a hundred dollars. Now the question is, will they pay $200 or they pay $300 and so on and so forth. Correct. Exactly. That's exactly it. So question, uh, this is a good segue. Uh, tell us about Dr. X. Obviously Dr. X started as a content business. They're selling, you know, information on, you know, you know, healthy living and really improving in how you feel. I mean, I'm, I'm actually going to be buying some of the collagen product. We, you know, I mean, you, <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the intermittent fasting, so I'm, I'm very big into into the health, you know, health health kick right now as well. But tell tell us a little about the evolution of Doctor Axe because obviously you guys started in that you know building an amazing name for producing you know content on you know feeling better and empowering others with health. But you, know, you guys have pivoted more from just a content game into doing a lot of e-commerce, and I think. That's what's really interesting of like, how do you pivot from a content industry into e-commerce? And then number two, how do you use long form content to sell products at scale? Because that's something uh, Facebook is very much about 15 second videos and this and that. But I, I, I love businesses that have that are very intelligent about using long form content, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, to quote the, uh, you know, I consider him the godfather in a lot of ways. I mean, it's Gary Vee and, it, you know, he's famous for saying, give value, give value, give value, and then ask for business. So for us, one of the ways that we give value, and you know, all of us as marketers, I feel like we should have it tattooed somewhere on our forearm that says, you know, people buy from brands they know, like, and trust, right? And so how do you establish that know, like, and trust factor? Well, it all comes back to giving value. And so, uh, which is why I consider Gary Vee one of the godfathers. And so, you know, if you followed his Wine Library TV um, efforts, he did over a thousand videos of just reviewing wine and just building building a tribe and a following by giving valuable content. Well, and so that's what we've modeled from day one. And our brand is a little bit different than his, which ours is more authoritative, educational, uh, you know, something that you can go to as 
a research driven type of brand. And so, in, but the same principle is still true is that we always look to lead with value. And so for us to kind of come full circle, you know, when I started, we had about three, 400 visitors per month to our website. As we started trying and failing and kind of figuring out SEO and really doubling and tripling down our efforts there, to this day, uh, we do about 14 and a half, 15 million unique visitors to our website. Uh, we have a couple Facebook pages, each of them over uh, 2 million likes. And uh, our email list is over two and a half million uh, subscribers. And, you know, the, the stats just kind of go, go on and on from there. But for us, the, the pivotal piece about all of this or the foundational piece is that it all starts with, with uh, providing value. And we do that in the form of education. And when I share about this, a lot of people ask, well, that makes sense because you guys, it's kind of obvious, like a health-centered uh, brand would educate on health and then also be able to sell health oriented products like it's an obvious pair but what 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 if i don't have a uh, a brand or a company where it's as obvious to do an educational type of content site and so to that i say you know usually my i get i get a text from my brother uh who's in college i don't know every week or every other week and it's usually he usually sends me a link to some viral like bmx video or (laughs) snowboard guy who's jumping over you know he's like He's built up his own little thing, jumping over a roof, you know, and then like it's just crazy stuff or jumping over this Grand Canyon. It's like epic Grand Canyon, like backflip, you know, thing. This is super viral videos. But there's no Um, value. There's no actual beyond the. Well, but here's the but here's the thing. All of them have one thing in common. They're all sponsored by Red Bull. (laughs) (laughs) Right. You've seen them. The experience, so, the Red Bull sponsors experiences. They exactly. Want. And so they are providing value in the form of entertainment. Yeah. And so it doesn't necessarily always have to be educational. So I would say if, if it's not a direct line for um, someone listening that, you know, your, your company, if it's not obvious, like what you could do to educate, maybe there's an angle that you could do that's more uh, entertainment based. So, for, you know, that's just a little aside, but for us, um, some of the things that um, we've been able to find that really work for us on the um, on the long form content stuff is, you know, our standard is it, again we want to give 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 value, and so we have really really high standards for everyone on our team, uh, especially on the content team. We have uh, about twenty five members on that team uh, full time. We have researchers. Uh, we have a medical researcher. We have editors, staff writers, graphic designers, video editors that all spend a lot, a lot of time doing the work and then thinking about the work and how we can make it make it better and build on our playbooks. So that's – and we can dive more into some of the content specifics, um, but that's a little bit how – And you guys – when you guys – like – when you guys start marketing your content, so there's two types of things you're marketing. You're marketing for direct response and you're marketing content. Um, how do you integrate your products into your content? Do you guys do a form of like an advertorial? Do you guys like, how do you guys like integrate your content into DR? Like, that's always been really interesting to me is like you have the trend, you know, here we're not trying to sell you something. We're trying to give, give, give. And then how do you integrate the DR into the content? Yeah, that's a great question. So, the biggest thing for us is is really capturing someone's attention. So whether it's on Facebook as a subscriber or their email address as an email subscriber, for us, we consider that a micro conversion on the path to you know a checkout conversion. Um, but the best way for us to do that is by providing educational content. But and then attracting a large audience to our site, building up that authority, and. Then once they're on our site, creating really valuable lead magnets to give away in exchange for someone's email address. And so I'll talk about that real quick. Um, There's two kind of key points here. One is a buddy of mine, Nicholas Kuzmich, is uh, one of the things that he's um, really nailed. He, He talks about insight versus information. And, you know, we are in the information age, obviously. Like I don't even, I don't even go to Google anymore. I don't know. I don't know if anyone does, you know, we just like yell at Siri and, and Siri Googles things on our behalf right? Yep. <laughs> or Alexa. So, you know, we just shouted our phones and, and it does the Googling for us. So we ha- there's no shortage of information, 
what they're what people are looking for is insight. And the difference between information and insight is that insight is what do you do with the information to get a desired result. And so that's where you as the expert or the brand, uh, anyone listening can can stand in that insight area and really provide that. And that's really valuable. Um, and, and for us, we, when we started doing ebooks and opt-ins and, and lead gen stuff to get people to opt in, uh, we thought more is more. That was kind of our MO. Uh, if we can just overwhelm them with quantity, then you know it's going to be a no-brainer. So we put together, we spent a lot of time and put together this really long, exhaustive uh, kind of overall health ebook, mm-hmm. overall guide to health, and uh, it was it was really high quality. But uh, I don't know if, if you're guilty of this, Steve, but I am. I have, I'd say every at least once a month, I I download a new ebook that only collects digital dust (laughs) yeah oh yeah i mean that's the reality is there's so many books you can't read every book it's just there's not enough time in the day to read every single thing you download and i think that you know i I know where you're going with this you know the volume saying you need content just because you need content is not (laughs) it's not a strategy it's it's a waste of time i mean i think that exactly you guys what you guys done really well in my opinion you know I, i read after the blue ribbon conference like I I read a lot of your stuff and it's not, it's not a volume play. You guys have very, very key insight and it's very applicable to like people's daily lives, you know? And then even the products you guys market, they're applicable to reaching desired goals with health. And I think that's really, that's really interesting. And I think like there has to be a correlation to the, and this brings up my point of like what I'm really fascinated with. There has to be a correlation to the content, to what you're trying to sell eventually down funnel. Obviously you guys, you guys do really good at grabbing intent and getting emails from lead magnets and, you know, up the funnel because you know that if a person is interested in a specific piece of insight, you know, what's actionable is going to be a purchase down the line. So maybe start thinking of like, if you are creating a lead magnet and you have something even non-health and you want to you want to build a following and build trust and give 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 start thinking of insight that's going to actually help help you know help make a buying decision maybe in there because i know you guys are really good at that you know that's going to influence and the word influence always comes about you know yeah absolutely well in in a great um example to kind of get some of the creative juices going if if uh, your audience wants to kind of start trying this is when we switched from the generic kind of guide to all encompassing health to uh, w- we had a thing at the time, this was a few years back, um, where we were talking about healing foods and foods that really promote health and wellness versus, you know, kind of the standard American diet type of foods. And so we put together what, what we called the healing foods shopping list. And it was, it was literally two pages. It was, there, there was not anything promotional in it. It was a checklist of foods that were Dr. Axe approved that you could print that checklist out, take it to the grocery store, and if you bought the foods that were listed out on that checklist, then you knew you're safe. You're in the, you know, you're in the diet, you know? And so it, it, was, it was that short and sweet insight that someone could download immediately and really get some, some value within the first two to three minutes of putting their email in and downloading the thing. And it's not this, this ebook that they say, ah, I'll get to that later. Or at some point I need to come back and read to that. And then every time they think of it, they just feel guilty for having that thing on their to-do list that they've never gotten you know, a chance to come back to versus the, the healing food shopping list. It was an immediate like, Oh wow, there is value that, you know, because I was able to use this right away, there's an, a value exchange there. And so then once we had their email, we, we provide value, and then you follow up with the, with the ask. You know, it's always very um, relative, and so relative, relevant. And so as, as specific and relevant as you can make the offer, uh, the better. So that's, that's kind of been our um, part of our playbook for at least providing content, capturing the email, and then making relevant offers. 
Interesting. And how do you guys leverage Facebook um, and pay just paid ads along with your content stream? So you're obviously direct linking to some of this content to generate top of funnel acquisitions. You're, you're generate, trying to generate emails, trying to generate you know top of funnel while also trying to generate down funnel acquisitions. So how does this all integrate into a bigger picture like Facebook ads or, or, acquis- or overall acquisition strategy? Yeah, that's a great question. We have there are kind of four things for me um, that I would consider our four pillars. Uh, we, it's SEO, and our SEO is uh, quality first. And uh, the second would be social. For us, we focus on Facebook. And this strategy, everything we do could be applied to Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest. doesn't matter what your social media channel of choice is in some regards. Uh, but we would much rather go a mile in one direction than a millimeter in a thousand directions. So we choose one and really focus on crushing it before we move on to the next one. So for us, SEO and content, uh, social media, Facebook, um, email marketing, um, and then paid advertising. So those are kind of our four pillars and, and how if I put together a, uh, a growth chart over the last five years and all four of those uh, channels have grown at the exact same ratio. Now, there's been some other pieces of our business that have grown a little bit at a steeper slope and others that have grown at a lot less of a steep slope, but those four are almost on the exact same line when it comes to growth. And so for us, it's really that the, the four pillars, that core to four that has really, uh, they, they all kind of feed each other because if you have really quality, quality content to start with, then that gives you something really valuable to share on social media, right? And now you're building that trust all along the way. And then if you share that stuff on social media, you have the same epic high quality content based on how people are engaging with that content on social. You take the best of the best and you plug it into your email. Now you're able to provide, you know, on three different channels, really high quality content. Now, because of all of that goodwill, because of all of that no like and trust, kind of what it all comes back to that you've built up with an audience now you're, you're, you have a self-fulfilling prophecy in a lot of ways when you come back to target that audience with paid advertising because you've done all the legwork up front to create it's your like own It's like seasoning the audience and warm pre- audience. Pre- preparing exactly. them to make a purchase and like, seasoning. You know, there you by go. bringing That's value exactly. to them. They're a lot more open to receiving your message than, say, a cold audience. And That's really interesting because I don't think a lot of – a lot of DR advertisers aren't really focused on the, on the long tail. They're not willing to make that big big investment top of funnel to really drive people to content. And it's hard because everyone, you know, every advertiser or most advertisers that we that I've worked with or we've worked with over the, over the last four and a half years of running an agency, it's really hard. They're always their question is is can you quantify our top of funnel work? Can you say like Steve that? What is the long-term value of us driving a lot of traffic to content and making content a big part of our acquisition strategy? And sometimes it's really, I mean, sometimes it's really hard, you know? And, and I guess my question to you is how do you quantify the work that you're doing on your top of funnel? Like how do you, you are driving a lot of Facebook traffic to some of your best posts that are bringing value to people and, you know, and goal to convert them down funnel. Like how do you quantify the work that you're doing to season customers, you know, on a specific channel, say Facebook? Yeah, so it you know attribution right is is always always the challenge. But for us, the, one of the easiest things is to look at that growth chart of those four uh, pillars growing at an aggressively high rate, all in tandem with each other over the last four years. So that's that's one way, and it's it's less of a direct answer, but it's more of you know how do we continue to reinvest uh, internally into content? Well. It's because of that. Is because of that growth on all four of those channels, and then for us, we we look at email marketing is our number one uh, revenue driving channel. But how do we grow our email list? Well, we grow our email list by producing super high quality content, getting it to rank in Google, you know, and then getting people to our site, and then they opt in. So all the way back up the top of the funnel, that's where we justify that expense and that investment is that we know ultimately that's one way we're going to drive email uh, opt-ins. Now, let me, I'll share a different story on um, a little bit of sequential um, messaging that we've done on Facebook that was uh, 
uh, probably a good case in point of some of this that we're talking about this investment in providing quality first. You know, I, I, I do think it's tempting as marketers to who, who have a budget or a quota to meet to really look at Facebook as a way to drive immediate return. And it's, it's month over month of, you know, playing the Facebook game. Yep. Yeah. But that, let me, that game is <laughs> right. But let, let me, let me share a story. And I, this might help some people who are on the fence and trying to figure out uh, how, you know, should they invest in more organic and, you know, some value based content and then the DR because I'm a huge proponent of both. So we, we put together, uh, we, we had this $1,500 program. It was an online institute where we were really going deep, teaching people about uh, essential oils and, and how to use them and, and really, really deep uh, education uh, on a $1,500 program. So we spent a ton of time putting this together, uh, teaching it. You know, doc, this is all taught by Dr. Axe and really, really great program. Well, what we did was we started out with what I call Facebook 1.0. And Facebook 1.0, I think, is what you know. Facebook in Q1 of 2017, they did over four billion dollars in revenue, and it's because of Facebook 1.0. Like you, you have so many massive uh, tools at your fingertips in Facebook advertising that if you just spend time on targeting alone, like you are able to drive profitable ads. Uh, and then if you spend more time on iterating creative and dialing in your audiences and doing lookalikes and all of that stuff that you can do, you're going to drive profitability. Like the more hours you put in using what Facebook has, like the more you're going to get out of it. So Facebook 1.0, it's what it, I think it's, right. It's why Facebook did four over 4 billion Q1 last year. That's what, what their why their platform is so powerful, all of the targeting that you can do. But a lot of people spend most of their time on targeting and then a creative. So they, they'll identify who needs to see this offer and then show them the offer and drive them to a conversion, which works. We do it really well. We uh, drive a lot of profitable revenue by doing that. We still do it to this day and it really works. Now, Facebook 2.0, which I think, I think you're going to start seeing a lot more people doing this over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and it will have a shelf life on it. But I think Facebook 2.0, at least what I'm calling internally looks a lot more like sequential messaging. It looks a lot more like what Purple Mattress is doing and a handful of others that have really dialed it in. Now, if you're not familiar with the Purple Mattress campaign, what they did was uh, they put together this five to seven minute video of this Goldilocks character and it's kind of silly and she's talking about they invented some like egg test, you know, to, to evaluate your mattress and it's kind of over the top. Um, it, and so I saw this ad in my in my newsfeed and had over a hundred million views. And I was like, man, you know, this is, this is like a good video, but it's not that good. <laughs> like it's not a hundred million organic viral views. Good. Like it's good, but you know, well, so I'm like, surely there has to be something going on behind this. And so I started, you know, our team kind of, we all started reverse engineering it and trying to <laughs> test and figure out what's going on. Well, when we, we did this uh, launch of this $1,500 program, uh, part of the, our advertising budget was to test and reverse engineer what we thought might be our theory was behind the purple mattress campaign. And what we so what we ended up doing was we did Facebook 1.0, which was uh, we, we would uplo- upload relevant uh, buyer list or relevant uh, visitors to our website who have looked at essential oil articles, and we would target them straight to the offer, and that was profitable. That was a CPA of about three hundred bucks for a $1,500 program. So that's great. Like I'll take it all day long. It was part of a three week launch and that was really great. On Facebook 2.0, what we did uh, as part of our, uh, our experiment was we put together a five to seven minute video of Dr. Axe and he's on the beach in kind of a different setting than what we normally put out. And he's talking about he's hitting on inspiration and he's hitting on education and how to become an essential oil coach. And so for the first 85% of the video, 90% of the video, it's all about education and giving people tips that they can take right away and, and, you know, start using right away. And then the last bit of the video, he basically says, Hey, listen, if you want to learn more about everything I'm talking about right here, click the link below, you know, I'm doing a webinar, go hop on the webinar and we'll go and we'll go kind of even deeper into all of this stuff. And so 
what we did, so we did that, and then we took people from that video and uh, drove them over to that webinar. And then what we found is we started targeting people who had watched more than 10 seconds of that one video. The CPA w- was $150. Wow. And so Interesting. half of what Facebook 1.0, just kind of direct targeting and a direct offer was. And so for us, you know, we, we really started scaling that, and that was part of a $3 million launch within three weeks. And so for us, and that Facebook 2.0 was, was the, one of the biggest drivers of kind of the success behind that launch. And so what's really cool about that, like that was really great, and it, you know, that, that video now has over 14 million views on it. But if you scroll down a little bit uh, under that video, there are over 30,000 shares of that video, which is essentially an ad. And so, you know, <laughs> uh, you, look at, you look at like major food brands like Skittles or Snickers, and these guys have 30 million likes on their Facebook page, but all they do is talk about themselves. They talk about Skittles. And, you know, here's a picture of Skittles with a, you know, at the park. And here's a picture of a Snickers billboard at the you know, Dallas Cowboys Stadium. Like, who cares? You know? And you look at who's look. you know, you look at the engagement on those posts and they have, you're talking about a page with 30 million subs- likes or subscribers and these posts have three, four, ten likes on these posts. It's a really, it's a really no. good case study. I mean, that's amazing. Like, it's a really good case study of like, arbi- like uh, maybe it's just a bigger picture of arbitraging intent and really... And really building trust. I think like that's literally, you know, your funnel, the funnel for, for this core, for the CBD is getting people to watch the, such high conversion rates from getting people to watch, you know, over 30 seconds, correct? On, on a long form content. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And maybe that's, maybe that could be a, a great model for if you do have a, 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 if you do have an expensive high AOV product is really, you know, setting your conversion objectives top of funnel on both Facebook and Instagram to drive traffic, you know, and tell Facebook to optimize around people who are most likely to engage for X amount of time. So maybe these time-based audiences, you know, because I know that was working really good for you guys because then, then now you're driving a super seasoned consumer into your funnel who's really invested. I mean, maybe the bigger picture is the more you can get consumers to invest time into you, the more likely they are to buy your product. That's yeah, that's exactly it. And so you start with showing them a really high value piece of content that's educational, but exactly like what you're saying, Steve, it's you're arbitraging intent. So you're you're educating them, but you're not just randomly educating them, right? You like for us, it was we're educating people who cared about essential oils and were curious about how to learn more about essential oils. So we start there by giving value to those people and we only show the direct uh, direct response ad to people who engage with that initial uh, five to seven minute video. So they essentially have to raise their hand. Now the volume's lower, but the quality is so much higher. And are you, that's really, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really, I mean, it makes sense. I guess the question is, is, you know, how do you, how do you do this at mass scale? Like how are you doing this across all your products? Does it only work for high AOV products? You know, can you, can you do this to drive people into a funnel to purchase everyday items, you know, and really show that, you know, do a, a two minute video on value of an apparel brand. I, I guess, you know, the, the application of doing long form content is really interesting to me. Like, you know, and I think as companies start exploring more and more and trying to season and make that customer experience a lot more synergistic with Facebook and you know, long form content is going to going to be even bigger, but any other really cool examples of long form content? Cause I think this is just, I think all their all of our readers. I mean, I'm even going to share this podcast with some friends who work at Facebook on the creative team because they're they're all actively trying to learn about creative. They're trying to learn their platform of how consumers react. You know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, on the long form piece, you know, well, just to kind of close the loop on the purple case study, they uh, um, they kind of came out of nowhere and in 2016 um, basically went from. 20 million in revenue to over 115 million in revenue. And then last year they sold for over a billion. So, you know, during that sweet spot of growth for them, they were running this campaign. And so, you know, (laughs) I would, I wouldn't say that's a guaranteed result, but that was the biggest driver of them being able to put their name on the map 
and then having a, a really, really massive exit. So I think you bring, yeah. up, you bring up something really, I mean, I think the way you we're kind of painting the picture is number one, give, 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 give. Number two, you know, create a long form piece of content that you're giving a lot and then you're running that as an ad. You're, you're kind of investing into bringing the most engaged people into your funnel. And I think, you know, you're investing in people's time. We could call that number two, invest to get people's time and attention. You're telling Facebook, using the Facebook algorithm and telling them to optimize my campaigns around people who are going to engage for a long period of time. Then once you have those long-term engaged audiences, then you're then you're selling them products that they are most likely to to be engaged that they're most likely to buy from you as a trusted brand. I think that's kind of the three pillars. W- would you agree that's a great three pillars of long form content as a strategy? I think so. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly it. I mean, you're you're creating awareness, you know, brand awareness, and then product awareness, and then a call to action. You know, and so. Whether you break that up over uh, three different videos or three different you know pieces of creative that they have to engage with one before they get sequenced to the next one, um, that's essentially the idea. And so, you know, for us for that video, it, it it wasn't three pieces; it was two. And it seems like you know, purple from my theory <laughs> behind purple is that they broke it up into two as well, where it's it's that super high value engaging you know again their value was entertain the entertainment aspect whereas our value in our five minute seven minute video was educational and authoritative but again that that's preferential you know that's up to like whatever aligns with your brand but then you as soon as you watch that purple video you'll find it um you know if if uh you go over to their facebook page i mean it's everywhere if you watch it if you watch it for just a you know, more than 10 seconds, pay attention to the ads that they're going to start showing you. And they're going to be ads that have way, way, way less engagement. And they're going to be very clearly direct response taking you to you know, a call to action. And so, but they're not showing those ads to just everyone. They're showing that, um, See, pushing uh, people farther the, along in the buying the viral thing. video to everyone. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's really interesting. And I, I think from a creative perspective, um, I don't know if we could call this a funnel. I think a lot of people love to refer to this as this is a conversion funnel. I don't like, I think the word funnel is, is misused a lot in our business, Evan. It's, it could mean a hundred different things. I love it. How like we labeled this sequential messaging. Cause that's what it is. It, it, it's a message. It's a message that leads to another message. And the word funnel is very ambiguous, I believe I think. It's it's very much like does that mean a website, a web funnel, or a video funnel, or conversion funnel? It's just it's a very it's a word that's kind of anomaly. It can mean a lot of things. And I love just talking more about this I know we've been on for a little while, but this this sequential messaging of preparing a user through messaging. I mean, that's we haven't even talked about leveraging Facebook Messenger. That's been a big win for us is really integrating Facebook Messenger into mm. into our marketing campaigns as as a main form of communication with a large base of audience. But I love this I love how you think, man. I, I gotta be honest. I, I talk to a lot of marketers and a lot of people in digital marketing and everyone is an expert. I mean I, I I've been doing this a long you know, nine, ten years, it's all I've ever done in my life. And I don't think I'm an expert. I go into each and every meeting with people and just say, I, there's a lot of stuff I can learn, you know, (laughs) (laughs) a lot of stuff that I'm not good at. And, you know, I, I I love how you think, man. I just just wanted to put that on the table. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I tell people I plan to retire when I'm 85. So, (laughs) but until then I'm, I'm going to be continuing to learn, you know? So yeah, I, uh, definitely a a lifelong learner. And, you know, and I think the thing is, it's always changing, you know, as, as you know, and running an agency and doing this for eight, nine, 10 years, you, you know, that it's you, what the, the tactic or the, the tool that you can, uh, really make it make work today or three months ago or six months ago is not going to be the same tool tactic or way that you're going to make it work in three, six months from now. But, the underlying principles of giving value first. You know, one of my favorite books is um, is called Scientific Advertising, and I believe the book was written in 1904. Wow, that's amazing. 
and, and it's by Claude Hopkins, and you know he he's some consider the father of direct response, and uh, and then he has another book, My Life in Advertising. Those two together are they're so amazing to read because the principles in there are absolutely timeless. You know, he's credited with uh, inventing the coupon. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, but but these things that we still do and apply today, the tools are different. It's not a newspaper ad. It's, uh, it's Facebook. And I but think, it's marketing and the underlying principles are just as true today as they were then. And, and I guess my frustration, you know, about the industry that I'm in, I'm in the internet advertising agency industry where I provide a service to companies. Uh, my frustration with the business I'm in is that most of our competitors are selling an algorithm. They're selling a data layer that we're going to do some data magic and we, our system will optimize the bids and blah, 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 blah. And, and I think that takes away from the bottom line picture of that, you know, we're marketers. Like we're like we understand the psychology. You can't hack the Facebook system. You can't you can't do one like you know, you can't tell Facebook to optimize this thing and magic is gonna happen. No, you have to get back into the weeds. You have to be a marketer. There's no hacks for the system anymore. And you know, putting people through like sequential messaging, that's marketing. That's that's seeing a billboard, you know, getting getting a message on Facebook, searching for it on Google and I, I love I love that. That's that's what excites me about. I get purpose in marketing because I'm a psychology nut. I, I've personally read <laughs> almost every psychology book on marketing. Robert Caldini's Psychology of Influence had a big impact on me. Um, yeah, and I hate it. What I hate about my industry, and I say hate's a bad word, but what I always you know t- tell people is don't buy the algorithm, buy the marketing, buy the messaging. All Facebook is is just a way to transport a message. It's <laughs> it's a messenger, you know, and you can say any message you want. Granted that Facebook's cool with it, but uh, <laughs> but you know, and I, I think I stress that for all my listeners is don't buy the algorithm, buy the message, and make make that message look very native to Facebook. Don't let that message look different. You know, if you, people can see an ad, they're, they're gonna get pissed off. You know? Yeah, you know, I'm glad you brought up uh, influence. I mean, that yeah, that book was pivotal for me as well. And I think one thing that if someone's, early, you know, I was guilty of it. I think a lot of people are. I think it's normal. But it, early on in, in a marketing career, I think it's tempting to go for the quick win or it's it's tempting to go for the uh, the uh, the latest blog post about, you know, seven ways to hack X, Y, or Z, right? Yeah. And it, it's kind of fun to learn some of that stuff. But at the, at the end of the day, Influence and, and some of these other psychology books – it, it comes down to empathy, and if you are marketing people in a, in a way that you're not putting yourself in their shoes and really thinking through, like, who am I talking to, and how do they want to be talked to? You know, the there's the golden rule of treat others like you would like to be treated, and I think the platinum rule is even better of treat others how they would like to be treated, and you really have to empathize and really put yourself in someone else's shoes whoever you're marketing to, to really start to get inside their head and really think through what are the things that drive them. And I know this, this can, you know, a lot of marketers talk about this and it can almost be written off as cliche, but it, it is so absolutely true that I think, I think empathy and data driven decisions, uh, as a marketer are, are definitely going to set you apart as a marketer and also help set your brand apart. Totally. And I always, piggyback on, on that is that you know expectations of the marketing channel of the message channel i think that more and more we're starting to see we're starting to itemize cha- marketing channels into this discovery or intent i think facebook people is a discovery channel instagram is a discovery channel you discover stuff on your news you, do, you don't but you might consume consume and discover two totally different things you might consume your product on amazon you might consume and buy a product on google and i I think it's really important when you think of doing your long form strategy is remember that people are consuming this. This is you're not shoving it down their brain. This is people <laughs> you know, you gotta make it so people can consume this and really if you're gonna do long form content, make a purpose behind it. You know, do stuff to, in within the video to really keep people watching. Uh, you know, a great example is I've seen a video that someone said, I'm gonna get to the main point you know, of how, how you're going to, you know, build a better diet. I saw this video and, you know, I think he did a really good job of saying why gluten is going to affect, you know, other areas of your life that you, and I'm going to get to that point. Well, what that does, that's a great segue into 
continuously watching the video. So someone's like, and I, I think there's messaging inside of videos and content and the way content is put together that really can bring listeners in for a longer period of time. Now, I'm not an expert at that, but we've been testing out a lot of different, you know, longer, longer form contests trying to figure out, will this drive an acquisition? And that's something for 2018 that I think is a big priority for us is really getting into the weeds on that. Mm, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Cool, man. Well, there, before we wrap things up, I know we've been on for an hour, and I really appreciate your time. I know you're super busy. We've been, been trying to plan this podcast for a while to get you on. Uh, is there anything? <laughs> <laughs> you're a busy guy, man. Is, is, is there anything like the, the else you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap things up? Yeah, I would. I would uh, leave with this. I would say, you know, talking about empathy and data and. Uh, really kind of getting using those two things to drive and, and thinking about your consumer. Uh, you also have to think about like, what are you building? You know, uh, it, it's so important to think about uh, Facebook is a tool. Ex- it, you're exactly right. It's, it's a tool to convey a message. So is print advertising. So is Pinterest. So is any of these other channels. And it, you know, if, if you were just trying to build something that's, uh, no matter what it is, lifestyle business and a big business, a, you know, a multi omni channel type of uh, <laughs> sales distribution type of business. I mean, it's all over the map. But I think if you don't decide what you want and what you want to build, you, you're not going to have any center of gravity and you're going to constantly be kind of uh, chasing the, the next blog post or the next strategy or the next tactic. And I would say for, for so many marketers that I meet, um, between the free content that is on this podcast on digitalmarketer.com and anything Russell Brunson says, I mean, the free stuff that is out there that if you're listening to this podcast, you have likely already uh, heard or been exposed to the ideas that will totally transform and help grow your business if you would go execute them. So I would just encourage people to, to think about what do you want and then really – Take, take an information diet for a moment and then really go focus on spending nine out of ten nine <laughs> out of ten uh, percent of your time focused on discipline of execution and I think you're going to be so blown away by the results of just doing the stuff that's already out there that's my biggest encouragement is that there, there's so many valuable free resources and tactics that uh, you, you could you could kind of drive yourself in circles all day long listening to the guru A or guru B who both have great advice but they conflict each other <laughs> versus just choosing one and, and really going for it. You know, it's like the uh, choose your uh, choose your uh, analogy or it's he who hesitates yeah. is lost and then look before you leap, right? Yeah. I, but you, you can spin in circles all day long, but if you it, choose one and go – and really focus on execution. You're going to be. I think you're going to be really happy. That, that could have said it better. And I'm going to. I'm going to piggyback on top. I'm just going to say, don't be scared to fail. Like I think that if you work at an organization, it's big, and you, you, you know, you can you can make positive change. And I think that's something I always lead with when I talk. When I talk to a lot of the brands we work with, a lot of people we work with. You know, you can make positive change, and don't be scared to really fail because you know what? A lot of us fail. Even. Evan, I'm sure, like, you know, <laughs> you're very successful, man, but, like, I'm sure there's times where you failed, and you're you're not scared to fail, and I think that's what I love to build into my organization is, hey, guys, you know, people are hiring us to, to figure out how to be successful, but don't ever be scared to fail, you know? Absolutely. Failure is great. Uh, make, you know, mistakes are great. Uh, not learning from or repeating the mistake is not great. So yeah, there, make a ton of mistakes. You know, the quicker you can make mistakes as you're learning and, and you know, making sure your Kaizen approach where you're always improving, documenting, and, you know, not repeating the mistakes, absolutely lean in and make more mistakes as you uh, document and, and learn from those mistakes. Cool, man. Well, I'm going to wrap things up there. I think that that's a really good uh, conclusion. Um, I really... Really appreciate your time, man. I think there's a lot of nuggets here that a lot of people are going to appreciate on long form content. Maybe even there might be a, a segment two on long form content in the future. Yeah, I guess you never <laughs> know, Evan. If we could, if we could talk you into, we go talk to your agent and see if we could uh, yeah. get you back on in the future, man. Because I, I think this is an, this is 
this is a topic that a lot of people are interested in. And I just want to say I really appreciate you taking your time out of your day. And uh, hopefully I can I can make it down to Nashville. We could uh, grab a beer at some point in the near future. Hey, man, I appreciate it. Steve, thanks for having me on, man.